My name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, October the 29th. We will sing several songs of praise to our Lord, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will uh, be somewhat enlightening and edifying to all of us. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, just in case you don't have that book, I will give you the title of the song. So if you do want to sing along, you don't have that book, you can Google the song or maybe you have a different book. They are <coughs> fairly common songs. The first song that we will sing is number 63, I Will Call Upon the Lord. I Will Call Upon the Lord. <clears throat> I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. And if you would turn to song 103, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. 103. <clears throat> I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. And 
And the song before the Lord's Supper is number 366, By Christ Redeemed. 366, By Christ Redeemed. <clears throat> By Christ redeemed and Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come. His body given in our stand Is seen in this memorial brand And as we drink we see the blood Until he comes and thus that dark betrayal night With the last advent we unite By one bright chain of living right Until he comes we come to the part of the service where we observe the Lord's Supper. We do this because we are instructed to do it on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 is very clear in that. And in that we gather together on the first day of the week, and in that we break bread together or we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, let's all remember uh, how important this is to all of us. Let's report, remember that Jesus instituted this supper on the night he was betrayed. When he was with his disciples, he explained to them of what they were to commemorate week by week on each first day of the week. The Apostle Paul in the first Corinthians chapter 11 reiterates this and almost word for word, he explains what the bread and what the cup are all about. And so as we gather about the table, Let's remember Jesus' sacrifice for each one of us. Let's pray for the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine wisdom that you sent Jesus to us and that he taught us the truths. Uh, we just take this time to remember his death, that he gave himself up as a one-time sacrifice for all. And as his body hung on the cross, we can't but remember the agony that he must have been in. So as we partake of this bread, help us to remember his body. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood for us. We just understand the magnificence of this sacrifice and that his blood is the blood of the new covenant. It is the blood that washes away our sins. As we partake of the cup, let us keep this in our minds, in our hearts. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, uh, we just take as a matter of convenience at this time the opportunity to give back to the Lord that which we have been prospered. Uh, we are told to do that also on the first day of the week. We are to lay by in store that with which we have been prospered. We have so many examples, wonderful examples in our New Testaments of giving. We have the widow and the mites. Uh, we just have uh, the idea of the Thessalonians giving to help people in other places. 
the Philippians giving to help people in other places. And now we have the opportunity to give back to the church so we can help people in other places, so we can help bring others to Christ, so that we can uh, help those that are in need. Uh, let's pray. We pray to Heavenly Father that you would bless us in our giving. We just pray that uh, we would come to understand how important it is to give back to you. How important it is to understand that you love a cheerful giver and that we should give not only with an open heart, but with an opening in mind that what we're doing is giving back to the Lord that which we have been prospered. Bless us and in our abundance that we might be willing to give back to you in all things. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 742. 742. Sometimes this song is referred to as Count Your Many Blessings. Uh, however, the title of the song is When Upon Life's Billows. When Upon Life's Billows. 742. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Oh, I know the Lord was praised in our singing. Uh, I know I was lifted up. I hope you were lifted up as well. If you were there this morning, you heard that uh, the title of the lesson this evening will be Dealing with Discouragement. Dealing with Discouragement. We are going to turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 and actually uh, chapter 18 and 19 to get the text of this lesson as it talks about the prophet Elijah. In chapter 18, the prophet Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to see if they could bring down fire to burn their offering. And we know the account. If we have read our Old Testaments very completely, uh, they prayed and they shouted and the louder they shouted and the louder they shouted. And their God, Baal, did not send fire down out of heaven. But 
after wetting things to the point of saturation, uh, Elijah called upon the Lord and the Lord sent down fire and burnt the sacrifice. He then took these 450 prophets of Baal to the brook of Kishon and these 450 prophets met their death. Now we have to remember the king and the queen at that time of Israel were uh, King Ahab and uh, Queen Jezebel. And uh, Jezebel was a vindictive, vindictive woman. And she said in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 2, Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. One of them was those 450 prophets who were slain. Now, we would say, Elijah, he was a strong, strong guy, wasn't he? Well, this was the kind of the one chink in the armor of Elijah. Because as we look in verses 3 and 4, it says about Elijah, he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came down and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. Wow. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? The prophet that did not die, that was escorted into heaven without uh, going through the valley of death, is the one that's saying, I'm better off dead. And so who is this man, Elijah, that we would study about? He was a prophet of God sent to the northern kingdom. That was Israel. And uh, this is where Ahab and Jezebel ruled. To get their attention, he prayed for a three and a half year drought, which did take place. He is the prophet who trusted, trusted God and won a great battle against the false prophets. And so here's a great lesson for us. This strong man, Elijah, who uh, through God defeated the prophets of Baal, was discouraged. He was afraid. And with that, we want to understand why Elijah was discouraged and what can be done about it. I would propose to you first that he was discouraged because the physical part of his life became more important than the spiritual. He had won a great physical battle and he should have been focused on the spiritual condition of his people and he was more concerned about his physical condition. Woe is me. Jezebel is going to come and get me, and she's going to kill me. It's so easy for us to get caught up in, a, in living that we forget to make our life a spiritual life. So that's number one. Two, Elijah, after having his eyes focused on God, lost his focus. Rather than leaving the situation in God's hands, he tried to protect himself, and he became discouraged. Sometimes we get discouraged because we take our eyes off of God. And when we do that, our situation actually looms larger than it is. He let his fear overcome his faith. You know what? Fear and faith cannot coexist one of the two will prevail, and we are the one who determines which will dominate our life. We will make that determination. Is it going to be our fear, or is it going to be our faith? Thirdly, he operated under an assumption rather than a fact. If we look at 1 Kings 19, verse 14, it says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life 
to take it away. Hmm. Doesn't sound like someone who's very focused. He was operating under a false assumption. It would cause, in verse 18, God to say, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah was having his little pity party. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to us? Uh, do we ever have a pity party on our own? Well, I, Elijah was having one. And so God said, Elijah, you're not alone. There are 7,000 faithful. You know what? If we think we're the only ones that are faithful, <laughs> there's news for us. We're not. That's rarely the case. That are, there are others that are striving to serve God just as we are. That's what our churches are all about. Our churches in the New Testament are people gathered together to strive together to be saved and to live eternally with the Lord. And so with that in mind, we're not going to leave Elijah out in the cold because Elijah was a great prophet. And so we ask the question, and this relates to each of, one, of us, how did he get over his discouragement? Well, first, uh, he let him reach the point of exhaustion before he gave him answers. Remember what Elijah did? He fled. He left his servant behind. And it says that he, he fleed, uh, to the point where, uh, he was just as tired as a person could possibly be. And, uh, with that, he was literally exhausted. And so, no doubt, the battle at Mount Carmel was mentally and physically exhausting. Think of the effort that it must have taken to slay 450 prophets of Baal. Think of Elijah's fleeing from Jezebel's threats. It was a distance of some 20 miles. He ran to Beersheba, and there was another 100 miles to take into consideration. He had to run or walk 150 miles. No wonder he requested death. No wonder that he laid down under a juniper tree to sleep. Chapter 19, verses 3 through 5. It's no wonder that he was discouraged. He was at the point of physical exhaustion. It's, it's easy to get exhausted when somebody is physically, it, it's easy to get discouraged, I'm sorry, when someone is physically exalted. But the flip side of exhaustion is that when we reach that point, it motivates us to say, there's got to be a better solution. And then indeed, we turn to our God. Does God let us take time off? I, I, I paused purposely. It's okay to relax. Jesus approved that. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 31, he said, Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. And so Elijah received rest from, from the uh, physical exhaustion that he had uh, experienced. And uh, God gave him strength to get over his discouragement, getting the proper amount of rest, the proper diet will go a long way in, in keeping us from getting discouraged. Two, God sent him to a holy place. He sent him to Horeb. Horeb was at the Mount of, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And this was a very special place to the children of Israel. 
It was the place where God made them a holy nation. It was the place where Moses went up to the uh, into the mountain and brought back the commandments from God. Sometimes we need to go to a comforting place. We need to go to... Now, <laughs> you and I don't have a Horeb. We don't have a place by Mount Sinai. But we have a place in our lives where we can go and we can relax and we can rest. Maybe we have a favorite chair in our house. Maybe there's a place where we can go and we can meditate for a while. Think, evaluate. We need to go and be reminded of what is good and what can be good. Third, God asked him a penetrating question. In verse uh, chapter 19, verse 9, he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? By the way, God wasn't asking this question because he didn't know the answer. This was something for Elijah. He was asking that question to help Elijah think about himself. Sometimes we just have to ask ourselves, why am I here? What am I all about? What am I supposed to be doing? Why am I discouraged? Why am I thinking this way? And God didn't need Elijah and Horeb. Just like he doesn't need us in the pit of despair in the, on, on the battlefield of faith. There are souls who need our influence. We have a job to do. And he saw that in Elisha and he said, you've got work to do. And so with that is the fourth way that uh, Elijah overcame discouragement. And that was that God gave him work. He sent him in verses 15 and 16 to anoint some rulers. And sometimes when we feel discouraged or a little depressed, we need to get our eyes off self and our eyes on others. Get the focus on ourself and put it on others. It's our kind of our assignment in life. And what we will find is <laughs> there are others that need our encouragement. That's what Hebrews 10, uh, 24 says. Let us look how we can encourage one another toward love and good deeds. We need to get a better perspective on our lives. And finally, he gave Elijah a friend. Elisha comes on the scene in verse 16. He said he went and he recruited Elisha to work with him. And they became the closest of friends. As a matter of fact, Elisha was the only one who saw Elijah ascend into heaven in 2 Kings 1 and 2. And no doubt, having that close companion kept Elijah from getting discouraged, and at least not to the degree that he had been before. Everybody needs a friend. Everybody needs a friend. It's a person that we can go to. It's a person to whom we can confess our troubles and our sins. This is the person that we can explain why we're frustrated. We can explain why discouraged. And it's one who uh, we can question our thinking about. How do we know that? It's biblical. In Ecclesiastes chapter eight, uh, 4, verses 8 through 12, the ecclesiastical writer says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the other will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. That is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 8 to 12. When we get discouraged, 
when we get discouraged, and we will, this is a good place to turn. First Kings chapter 19. And think about the lessons in this great chapter. What Elisha went through can help us to go through similar situations. What God did for Elijah to overcome discouragement, he will do for us to allow us to overcome our discouragement. I hope that this lesson just planted a little seed about discouragement and about seeming despair in our lives, what causes it and what we are to do about it. You know what? <sighs> Biblical people aren't the only ones that talk about fear. An unknown author says, fear, false evidence appearing real. The sportscaster on TV, Robin Roberts, said, focus on the fight, not on the fright. Robin Roberts overcame cancer. If you remember uh, the old days before digital photography, uh, film was taken into a dark room to be developed. With that, fear is a dark room where negatives develop. There is an unknown author that said, feed your faith and your fears will starve to death. And finally, the philosopher uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, Fear defeats more people than any other one thing in the world. He said, we're defeated by fear. Let's not be discouraged. Let's turn to the Lord because he has the answers. We uh, can go to the place that is uh, the best for us. Uh, we can... Uh, understand why we are where we are. We can get ourselves in the work that God has set before us. And finally, we can make sure that we have somebody in our lives that we can turn to and be encouraged by. I hope this lesson was beneficial to all of us. I pray that all of you are on the road to salvation. But if you're not, if you've not taken Jesus into your life, we offer that invitation to you. If you have heard and believed the good news of the Lord, we pray that you respond by confessing Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of your former lives, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. This is your invitation tonight. If you need to come to the Lord, be in touch with us and we will help you. Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. I pray that uh, this message will give us pause for thought and just plant a little seed in our lives about uh, dealing with the discouragements of life, uh, what causes them and how for us to deal with them. There are those in our lives that are suffering at this time. We pray for them. There are those in our lives that are suffering maybe physically and spiritually. Help us to be that friend, like Elijah had Elisha, to encourage them in love and in good deeds. We pray that you would be with us this evening. Help us to rest comfortably, thinking that and knowing that you are our God and Jesus is our Savior. Bless us and be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. I pray that you will all be safe, and may God bless you all. Men of sorrows, water.